ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم لا سهل الا ما جعلته سهلا وانت تجعل الحسن اذا شئت سهلا اللهم اجعل عملنا كله صالحا ولوجهك خالصا ولا تجعل لاحد فيه شيئا This is uh, lesson number 6 from the lessons looking at reflections upon selected daily supplications uh, compiled by Sheikh Abu Muhammad Abdul Rauf Shakir Hafizahullah may Allah bless him and protect him and preserve him and reward him with the greatest reward that he gives to his creation Alhamdulillah we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us again we have to thank Allah for allowing us to gather in his house to study to learn to continue to want to improve ourselves and to strive to be better and better and better it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has placed in our hearts to come to his house it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes his house available for us to be able to come to and that insha Allah we come here gathering to learn our deen and to get closer to him to strive to seek the easier path to jannah nam man salaka tariqan yaltamis bihi ilman sahala Allah lahu bihi tariqan ila aljannah whoever treads a path seeking knowledge making the smallest effort to seek knowledge then Allah will make easy for that person the path to jannah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make easy for us the path to jannah Uh, we've been looking at the different reflections uh the different daily supplications that we say trying to be of those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more because the more that we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more beloved that we become to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the more beloved that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes to us and the more that we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perhaps the more that we will be blessed to be grateful and the more that we remember Allah the more that we will remember our shortcomings and our duty to him and perhaps we will seek forgiveness more and perhaps those meanings if Allah blesses them to develop in our hearts as they should then Allah will have mercy on us on the day of judgment we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on us on the day of judgment and to make our crossing over the bridge easy for ourselves and for our families for our children for our offspring for our believers for our friends who are believers now and so we've learned inshallah we've learned plenty several supplications we learned the supplication to say when we go to sleep we say bismika allahumma amutu wa ahya with your name in your name remember your name o allah i die yani i sleep and i wake up i come back to life and then we learned what to say when we wake up alhamdulillahi alladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatana wa ilayhi an-nushur all praises to the one who causes caused us to live after he caused us to die and to him is the resurrection and we learned what to say when we go into the bathroom bismillah allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal khaba'ith with the name of allah o oh allah i seek refuge with you from the female and male jinn or from evil and its people and that when we exit the restroom we say ghufranak your forgiveness o oh allah for the many blessings that we don't appreciate amongst them the food that you blessed us to eat and the body that you blessed to draw the nourishment from that food as well as the ability that you've given us to remove those harmful elements now and also what we say when we put our clothing on alhamdulillah alladhi kasani hadha wa razaqanihi min ghayri hawlin minni wa la quwwa all praise be to the one who clothed me with this and provided it for me without any power or might of my own and we learned the reward of that if a person says that when he puts on 
a garment of clothing is that his previous sins will be forgiven. We ask Allah to forgive us our sins and to make us thankful. And so we want to look at the study guide from last week before we go into the new lesson for today. Uh, the first question from study guide number for number lesson number five. How does Imam Ashokani, rahimahullah, differentiate between hamd, praise, and shukr, thanks, in terms of how they are expressed? How does he differentiate between hamd and shukr? In terms of how they are shown, how we show, yes. No. No, that shukr, that hamd, excuse me, is done with the tongue. Imam Ashokani mentions that it's done with the tongue, whereas shukr is done with the tongue, the heart, and the limbs. And we also mentioned that. And a hamd is also done with the heart as well, but he was just talking about the actions in and of themselves, meaning, and if you don't say hamd with your tongue, then you haven't done hamd and you haven't praised. Number two, how does Ashokani, Imam Ashokani, rahimahullah, differentiate between hamd and shukr in terms of their causes or reasons? What makes a person uh, give hamd and what makes a person give shukr? How does he differentiate between them? That hamd is only for, sorry, hamd is for qualities and also for actions. And if someone is kind to you, then you praise them. And also if someone is just, and he has good quality, someone's brave, someone's strong, someone's uh, 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 well-mannered, so you praise them for those things. Whereas shukr is only for kindness that's shown. Shukr is for those good things that have been done for an individual. Now, uh, what are two blessings of clothing mentioned by the author? Two blessings of clothing mentioned by the author. Yes. No. No. Zakhallah khair. Now, clothing is used any, as a necessity to cover us, to cover our nakedness, uh, what we should be ashamed of other people seeing. And it's also used to beautify. And it not only does it perform the necessary action, but it also beautifies the human being as well. What does the author mention must be avoided when wearing clothing? What does the author mention must be avoided when wearing clothing? Yes, arrogance and pride. Arrogance and pride. That a person not be arrogant when he puts on his clothing, not be proud, not to look down on others because he, re he recognizes that whatever he has of clothing is from Allah. However fine that clothing is, Allah is the one that blessed him to have it, so there's no reason to look down on anyone else because what you have is the decree, what Allah has decreed for you and what Allah did not decree for someone else. And so just like not having is a test for that person, having is a test for you, if Allah has blessed you to have it. It also indicates for us as well the importance of intention when we put on clothing. We didn't go into detail about this, but it's important that we be conscious of why we're putting on our clothing. Are we putting it on so that people praise us? Are we putting it on so that we can attract other people's attention? It's important. It's important. And a person can put on clothing and be sinful. And a person can put on clothing and get a reward. And he, uh, from the tafsir of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, in, of the ayat, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ and they deserve, any women deserve, what is expected of them, of goodness, yani, that a wife is expected to beautify herself for her husband. And also, Ibn Abbas mentions that also the husband should what? Look nice for his wife, just like she's expected to look nice for him. And so a wife and a husband can put on a garment of clothing and get what? A reward for trying to look nice for one another. SubhanAllah. A husband and a wife can get a reward for the clothes that they put on if the person, if the spouse is thinking about looking nice for the other spouse. And even if the other spouse recognizes it or doesn't recognize it. If they appreciate it or don't appreciate it. If they say something or they don't say something, a person still what? 
gets his reward with Allah. Rewards, yani deeds are by intention. And so if a husband dresses to look nice for his wife and she doesn't notice, he goes and gets a haircut. And he, we get haircuts regularly, right? But a person gets a haircut, why? To look nice for his wife. He can get a reward for that haircut that he just got. And if she comments on it or doesn't comment on it, it doesn't make a difference. Allah saw your intention when you did it. And same for the wife. The wife can get her hair done, she can make herself look nice for her husband, and she gets what? A reward for doing so. No. And so that's important. Even a, even a child, any, a child who knows that their parents don't like certain clothing, certain hairstyles. If the kid or the child eats it, and he doesn't get what he wants to get because he knows that his parents don't like it or prefer him to look another way, and he does that for the sake of Allah, and he, I'm doing it as a, as a means of making my parents happy because I know making my parents happy makes Allah happy, then what? Gets a reward for dressing the way and keeping his hair the way that his parents like. Any, the idea is what? That even in dressing we can get a reward. And so it's important that we be conscious of that. And even in dressing we can get what? We can get a sin. A person is dressing a certain way to resemble a disbelieving people. That's sinful. And not that you just like the style, but that you want to resemble any, someone who doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's who you want to emulate. And that's, any, that's sinful. No. We ask Allah to save us from the sins, from the evil of ourselves and from the evil of the shaitan. When does the author state that outer garments cease to be beneficial? When does what we wear on the outside not benefit anymore? Yes? No. When a person is not concerned with his heart, He's not concerned with his iman, with his righteous actions, with staying away from haram, with fearing Allah, then what he wears on the outside doesn't benefit him. And we have to take that as a lesson as Muslims. We have to take that as a lesson as Muslims. That as much as we are concerned with looking the part, looking like a Muslim isn't going to benefit us much if we want, if we don't act like a Muslim, if we don't believe like a Muslim, if we don't fear Allah like Muslims. And the outside is important, but it's not everything. And looking like a Muslim is not going to benefit us if we don't, if we don't try to rectify our hearts as well. The garment of taqwa is better. It's better than the garments of the outside. The garment of a taqwa, fearing Allah, is better than the garments on the outside. And the kafir has garments to close his body, but he's naked when it comes to his iman. And so the Muslim has to be concerned with his heart as well and making sure that he covers himself with this deen. Sibghat Allah. Sibghat Allah. Yani it is, the, it is the die, it's the cast of Allah. Yani what a person is able to cover his complete, yani soak himself in the deen. Sibghat Allah. Yani it is the die of Allah. Yani the die like the coloring die. That a person is supposed to do what? Soak himself in like a garment. And when you dye a garment, then it what? The color? stays. Yeah, so we're supposed to soak ourselves in Islam and not to let that color fade away. No. Uh, what does the phrase min ghayri hawlin minni wa la quwwah mean? Without any power, any control of my own. I couldn't, any, I have no power to do it and I have no power to change anything except with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how does the author explain that this phrase applies to clothing? How does and it How does it apply to clothing that we cannot what? We could not create the clothing itself or the material that it comes from. We couldn't create that, and we couldn't provide it. And it would, we wouldn't be able to purchase it. We wouldn't be able to manufacture it without the help of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That Allah provided the actual material for us to be able to clothe ourselves and then allowed us the ability to be able to purchase it. And subhanAllah, I mean, look at how much clothing again is, is, is available. You know, a person can go, for example, to the Goodwill, to the Salvation Army and find what? Rows and rows and rows of clothes that people have what? 
that no longer want, not even that they're worn out, just that they're tired of wearing them and they want to leave them for what? For someone else to wear. And how much clothing exists in used clothing stores, on the shelves that no one will ever buy. Allah is good to us. No, but most of people don't show gratitude. We ask Allah to make us grateful. And so this, this, this uh, last supplication, Alhamdulillah ladhi kasani hadha wa razaqanihi min ghayri hulam minni wa laquwa was a pretty long, yeah, supplication. Inshallah, you've learned it. If not, inshallah, you got another week, yeah? This week's supplications, we got two supplications. And they're the same supplication. And they're very easy. Inna ma'al usri yusra. Most of you already know this supplication. What is it? Bismillah. The next two supplications are Bismillah. Huh? So if you didn't learn last week's supplication, you still have time to learn it, especially for our brothers and sisters who have taken the contract. Yeah? Uh, don't forget that the app, Fiqh of, uh, of, of Adhkar and uh, Fiqh of Adhkar and, and Dua, Jazakallah Khair, Fiqh of Adhkar and Dua. Don't forget the audio, the audio files are found in the, in the app as well for you to be able to listen to and they can also be slowed down. Taif, we're on page 28 of the book for those who are following along in the book. It says, when getting undressed, Bismillah. When getting undressed, Bismillah. Text of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, the screen which is between the eyes of the jinn and the private parts of human beings, when any of them removes his clothing, is that he says, Bismillah. Sitru ma bayna a'yun al-jinn wa awrati bani adam idha dakhala ahaduhum al-khala ahaduhum al-khala Bismillah. The screen which is between the eyes of the jinn and the private parts of the human being, when one of them removes his clothing or when he goes into the uh, place to relieve himself, is that he says, Bismillah. So this supplication is what? Bismillah. When we do what? When we take off our clothing. Because it provides a screen between us and the jinn. Explanation of the hadith. The saying of the Prophet ﷺ, Bismillah, means in the name of Allah and or with the name of Allah. In the name of Allah, I remove my clothing or with the name of Allah, I remove my clothing, meaning seeking his protection from every evil being and every harm. I remove my clothing, seeking his protection from every evil being and every harm. This is because the name of Allah is like a seal covering the human being, which the jinn cannot break, open, and get through. And so when a person says Bismillah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what? Places a cover on the human being that prevents the, the jinn from being able to, to see. It is a protective barrier. Remembering the name of Allah is a protection for human beings from the shayateen. And remembering Allah is a protection from the shaitan, from the shayateen of ins, and the shayateen who are people, and the shayateen who are jinn, in all situations. Remembering Allah is a protection from the shaitan in all situations. If you go to the study guide that we have and we look at the back, uh, number one is from a long hadith, it's the hadith that is uh, from Harith, Al-Harith, Al-Ash'ari, collected in a Tirmidhi. It's a long hadith, which is the counsel that Yahya ibn Zakariya, alayhi salam, was told to give to the children of Israel. That he was told to gather them and to admonish them. And so he gave them five pieces of advice. And that those five pieces of advice they are mentioned at the beginning of Al-Wabil Al-Sayyib, uh, the dua and supplication book uh, written by Ibn Al-Qayyim uh, Al-Jawziyyah. Ibn Al-Qayyim Al-Jawziyyah, uh, in his dua and supplication book, he mentions this, this hadith. Uh, now, and it's also been made into its own book. It's been translated into English. 
uh, and it also has the explanation of Shaykh Abdul Razak, uh, Al Badr Hafidhullah. And you know, the last, the last, the last advice or last piece of advice that he gives to Banu Israel, he says, "And I command you to remember Allah, and I command you to remember Allah, for indeed the likeness of that is that of a man whose enemies quickly track him." Yani a person's enemies are hunting him down. Yani a person imagines himself in the middle of the street, late at night, and all of a sudden, around the corner come some people who are looking for him and looking to take his life, or to harm him, or to rob him, or to steal from him. And so they're running after him, and he's running. He says, until he reaches an impermeable fortress. He reaches a fort that no one can get into in which he protects himself from them. And he's running for his life as fast as he can. And then he, mashallah, he makes it to a building that they have no ability to get into. And he's able to protect himself. And as long as he stays within that building, he's protected from their harm. He says, this is how the worshiper is. He does not protect himself from a shaitan except with the remembrance of Allah. It's when we remember Allah that we are protected from the shaitan. And it's when we stop remembering Allah and we neglect to remember Allah that the shaitan has an opportunity to do what? To get the better of us. And so it's an encouragement for a person to do what? To remember Allah at all times. For Allah always to be on a person's tongue and in a person's heart. Now, and so the author here mentions the author here mentions that also as it relates to when we undress, that it's a protection from the jinn seeing us, and that's because the name of Allah is like a seal covering the human being which the jinn cannot break open and get through. Now, so that's the first point, that we protect ourselves from the jinn seeing us and also from all their other harm by remembering Allah Ta'ala. He then says, one must not add to this expression, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, since the Prophet Sallallahu stopped upon these words for this particular occasion. And in this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that the screen between the eyes of the jinn and the Nakedness of the human being is to say Bismillah. He did not say to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And so he's saying in this situation in particular, a person should not add ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Because here it says Bismillah. And so he's mentioning to us that the Messenger وسلم, has a right over us when we want to use his phrases as a means of protection, the phrases that he taught us as a means of protecting ourselves is that we stick to the phrases, that we stick to the phrases. Allah has a right over us, that we remember him and we seek protection with him in remembering, through remembering his name. And that the Prophet Sallallahu has a right over us in that when he teaches us a phrase to say that we limit ourselves to that phrase. And so he says, one must not add to this expression, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, since the Prophet ﷺ stopped upon these words for this particular occasion. So if a person undresses, he should not say, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Person might say, well, what's wrong with saying Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim are the names of Allah. The names of Allah are wonderful, they're beautiful. They are, they are wonderful and beautiful. But in this situation, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that. In this situation, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that. And so we seek closeness to Allah by following the Prophet ﷺ. And this is a point that Imam al-Si'di mentions in his fatawa. This is a point that Imam al-Si'di mentions in his fatawa. That when we supplicate to Allah, when we pray to Allah for something, or we Remember Allah, that there should be two intentions that are there. 
one intention is that we're trying to get what we're asking for. So when we say Bismillah, we're trying to do what? Keep the jinn from being able to look at our nakedness. There should also be another intention, and that is what? To draw close to Allah at the same time. Because these remembrances are worship. These remembrances are worship. And worship has two conditions in order to be accepted. The first condition is what? Come on, we're worshiping Allah, people. We got to know what the two conditions are. Or maybe we're not, our worship is not being accepted. What's the first one? It has to be it's intention, it has to be sincere for Allah. Why are we doing this? We could be saying gufranak when we, go in, when we come out of the restroom, but only because there are people outside. We want them to know that we know the dua. La. We're saying it because we sincerely want Allah to what? To forgive our sins and to help us to be grateful. And so we have to do what we do sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other condition is what? It has to be in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu and so we stop where the Prophet ﷺ stopped when we know that he said specific words. So he says, one must not add to this expression, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, since the Prophet ﷺ stopped upon these words for this particular occasion. And Allah says in Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter number 33 of the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ You have an excellent example in the Messenger of Allah, لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا اللَّهِ Whoever hopes for Allah, to get close to Allah, and he wants a good reward on the day of judgment. And remembers Allah much. You have an excellent example if you want to remember Allah. Because the Prophet was the best person to remember Allah. He says, Hafidhullah, in this same way, the Prophet limited himself to these words, Bismillah, before performing ablution, wudu, and before eating. Before wudu and before eating. Now as it relates to eating, the scholars do differ as it relates to eating because the hadith related to eating don't specifically say Bismillah. When the Prophet ﷺ saw the young boy reaching his hand in the dish to eat, he said, Ya ghulam, Samillah. Yeah? Oh, young boy, he said, say, Yani, say the name of Allah. Or in some narrations, Qul Bismillah. Wa kul bi yaminik, and eat with your right hand. Wa kul min ma yalik, and eat from what's nearest to you. And so some of the scholars, especially some of the later scholars, like Sheikh Uthaymeen, Sheikh Ibn Baz, Sheikh Fawzan, uh, they've mentioned that. If a person adds a Rahman Rahim, then that is okay. That is okay. Because the fact that it says Bismillah doesn't mean that any a person can't add the name of Allah to it in particular. Any just like when we're commanded to give salams. Any a person gives salams by saying Assalamu alaikum. And a person gives salams by saying Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And a person gives salams by saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All of these are called salams. All of these are called giving salams. So some of the scholars have mentioned that, that it's okay to add ar Rahman, ar Rahim as it relates to eating, as it relates to eating. Now, he says, on other occasions, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam added to the words Bismillah other supplications. Yani sometimes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he would add other words to Bismillah in different occasions. He says, as when entering the bathroom, Bismillah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubthi wal khabaith. And when leaving one's home, Bismillahi tawakkeltu ala Allah. In the name of Allah, I put my trust in Allah. And upon sleeping, Bismika with your name, O Allah, Bismika Allahumma Amutu wa Ahya. With your name, O Allah, I die, and I sleep and I wake up. And so the Shaykh here is mentioning two points. Number one, when Bismillah is mentioned, 
because only Bismillah was mentioned, then we should stick to Bismillah. And he's citing here that further evidence that we should stick to Bismillah is what? Is the fact that we have other supplications where the Prophet ﷺ said, extra. And so the fact that the Prophet ﷺ added extra on certain occasions means that if he wanted to add extra, then he would have added extra. But the fact that he only said Bismillah indicates what? That only Bismillah should be said. And so, again, there are scholars that say it's okay to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Shaykh, however, is mentioning here that it's better to only say Bismillah because that's what the Prophet ﷺ said. And also because we have instances where the Prophet ﷺ added other words. And so when the Prophet ﷺ didn't add, we also shouldn't add. And perhaps further evidence for this, if we turn to the, the other side of the study guide again, hadith number two, which if you're following with the 40 hadith class, which again is a very, very important class, it's on Fridays after Salat al-Isha, from the website it streamed, islamlecture.com, islam not islamic, lecture not lectures.com. And also, uh, it's at UMM on Fridays uh, after Salat al-Isha. If you have the ability to attend that class, it is an excellent class because these 40 hadith, wallahi, these 40 hadith, they are amazing. And if a person memorizes these hadith, they become principles by which to live. Principles by which to live. If you have to choose one class to attend, you say, well, I either Thursday or Friday. I, I can't attend more than one class a week. Attend a Friday class. It's much better. Well, I, it's a much better class. Well, I, we're going to apply a principle from that class right now. Watch, watch, how this, watch how this works. Hadith number 11 from the 40 hadith of Imam An-Nawawi. Hadith number 11, the hadith of At-Tirmidhi, the hadith of Abi Muhammad, Al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu anhu, Sibti Rasulillah, Sibti Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa rayhanatuhu, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu anhuma wa an ummihi, and may Allah be pleased with his mother as well, as well as his father. Naam, he said, Hafidhtu min Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I memorized from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Da' ma yaribuka ila ma la yaribuk. Leave what gives you doubt for what doesn't give you doubt. Leave what gives you doubt for what doesn't give you doubt. Type. How can we apply that hadith to what we're studying right now? Right? Hmm. As regards to adding a Rahman al Rahim to when we say Bismillah. Taib, what don't we have doubt about? That we can say Bismillah. We're agreed we can say Bismillah. What do we have doubt about? Can we add a Rahman al Rahim to Bismillah? And so, based upon this hadith, what should we do? Just say Bismillah. If we say Bismillah, we're sure we're safe. If we add a Rahman and Rahim, we're not. We're not sure. So leave what gives you doubt for what doesn't give you doubt. And if you just say Bismillah, no problem. If you say Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, maybe, maybe that's correct. Maybe it's not correct. And it's important as well that when a person is going to forbid evil, he has to be clear that what he's forbidding is evil. And if a person says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, do we say that you've gone against the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu No. Why not? Because there are scholars that say it's okay. People who were learned, who love the sunnah more than we do, and who strive to follow the sunnah as well, that say what? Saying ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is not a problem. And so as long as there is room for that disagreement, then if somebody doesn't take the opinion that we take, then what? It's okay. It's not the end of the world. The problem is, is when we think that there's something that's moon caught, something that's wrong, and it's not, it's not wrong. 
It's a problem when we say that something is haram and it's not haram. وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُوا أَلْسِنَتُكُمْ الْكَذِبَ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ لَا يُفْلِحُونَ And don't put your tongues to say that this is halal and this is haram lying against Allah. Those who lie against Allah will not be successful. And so we have to be careful. When we tell people they can't do something that it's against Islam, that it's against the Sunnah of the Prophet, we have to be what? Sure, it's against the Sunnah of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I learned in the class. Okay, what you learned in the class is not the entire Sunnah of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Before, before you say something, what? Be sure that what you're speaking out against is, is incorrect. Leave what gives you doubt for what doesn't give you doubt. I know if I don't say anything and I don't know, I'm not sinful because I don't know. But I'm not sure if I say something, if it's correct or not. So what should I do? I should leave it. If I don't know the ruling, am I responsible to say something? No. I'm not required to say something unless I, I know. And I don't? No. So leave what gives you doubt for what doesn't give you doubt. We ask Allah SWT to help us to apply all of the sunnah. And not the sooner that we, that we like to apply. Now, and so again, that's what I'm saying. This, that's a principle. And this, this principle can get you out of some, some, some difficult situations. I don't know what to do. Like, what am I sure about? I'm sure about this. What am I not sure about? I'm not, leave what gives you doubt for what doesn't give you doubt. Now, he says on other occasions, he added to those words, to, to the words Bismillah, other supplications, as when entering the bathroom, leaving one's home upon sleeping. Again, the Sheikh is mentioning that it's better to say Bismillah. If a person says Bismillah rahman rahim can we say that they're wrong? No, we can't say that they're wrong. But for ourselves, you know, we are worshiping Allah by limiting ourselves to Bismillah. Because for us, that's, that doesn't give us, that doesn't give us doubt. Now, page 30, he says, from this we know that for every occasion, the Prophet has a prescribed specific words. And that's from the beauty of the deen, is that for every situation, we know specific things to do. And that's, that's a part of what we're striving to do. And Abu Muhammad mentioned in, the, uh, in one of his lessons on the 40 hadith, you know, something profound, which is that no, actually, it wasn't in the actual class itself. It was after the class. And if you, if you come to the class in person, then sometimes after the class, we sit down and talk a little bit. Yeah. If you don't come, then you don't get that. Huh? Allah Akbar. Um, Allah make us appreciate for his blessings. But one of the things that we talked about is how, Yanni, that he talked about was how a lot of times things happen in our lives. And every event that happens in our lives, there's a sunnah that we're supposed to follow. And if we don't learn the sunnah of the Prophet, then we don't know. We don't know what to do. We get angry all the time. The Prophet gave us guidance on how to get angry. What we do when we get angry. And he also got angry because he's a human being. What did he do when he got angry? It's important because we get angry every day or every other day. Sometime in our lives, we get angry. What do we do when we get angry? There's a sunnah to follow when we get angry. And guess what? If you follow that sunnah, not only do you save yourself from harm, but you get a reward. You get a reward because you did something based upon what? Based upon sunnah, based upon knowledge. It's not just I got good character, I got good manners, and my mother taught me good at home, or my father taught me good at home. It's not just that. There might not be any reward for that. But when I do it with an intention, I'm going to shut my mouth right now because the Prophet ﷺ said, also in the 40 hadith, number 15, whoever believes in Allah and the day of judgment, then what? Then he should speak well or keep his mouth shut. I'm going to shut my mouth right now because the Prophet ﷺ said that if I don't have something good to say, I should keep my mouth shut. Now, not only does he save himself from saying something negative, but he also what? Gets closer to Allah by shutting his mouth. Because he shut his mouth based upon knowledge. 
And we have things to do when we take off our clothes. We have things to do and say when we use the bathroom. We have things to say and do when we eat. We have things to say and do when we leave our homes, when we get in the car. These are all opportunities to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it shows the comprehensiveness of our religion. He says, from this we know that for every occasion the Prophet ﷺ has prescribed specific words. Hence, the believer must faithfully adhere to his specific words. He strives to say exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said in these situations, keeping in mind that it is revelation from Allah. What the Prophet ﷺ said, he says because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to say it or affirmed his saying it. As Allah the Most High says, مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى Your companion has not gone astray, nor has he erred. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى And he doesn't speak of his own desire. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى It is only revelation revealed. And so if a person follows the statements of the Prophet ﷺ, he feels comfortable that, that this is what Allah wants us to say because he taught the Prophet ﷺ. Also, he says, when starting evolution, we're on page 31, when starting wudu, we say bismillah. When starting wudu, we say bismillah. He says, the text of the hadith, there is no prayer for one who does not perform wudu. La salata liman la wudu ala. There's no pr prayer for the one that does not have wudu. And there is no wudu for the one who does not mention the name of Allah on it. وَلَا وُضُوءَ لِمَنْ لَمْ يَذْكُرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ And there is no wudu for the one that does not mention Allah's name over it. Naam. So here we're talking about saying Bismillah at the beginning of one's wudu. At the beginning of one's wudu. That here the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said that there is no salat for the one who does not perform wudu and that there's no wudu for the one who does not mention the name of Allah upon it. Now, at the time of performing, wudu. Explanation of the hadith. He says, saying, the saying of the Prophet wasallam, Bismillah, in the name of Allah means, in the name of Allah, I perform ablution, yani I perform wudu in preparation to stand before him, yani Allah in worship, or for recitation of the Qur'an. I'm performing wudu in preparation to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a person washes himself before he stands in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya, and also before he stands in front of Allah on the day of judgment, he's also, he's also what? Washed. The last rite, one of the last rites that a person has when he dies is that the Muslims do what? Wash him. Wash him before he stands in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Now, which is a, a beautiful, and it's, a, it's a beautiful honor for the one who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so before he stands in front of him to pray or reads from his book, then he performs wudu saying bismillah, mentioning the name of Allah at the time of doing any deed that is pleasing to Allah. Any a person remembers the name of Allah before performing wudu, which is an act of worship. And a person mentions the name of Allah at the time of doing any deed that is pleasing to Allah, and doing so reminds him that all good is from Allah, and every success is with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, that every, that all good is from Allah, and every success is with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the benefits of saying bismillah, is that we're reminded of our own weakness and that we depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is important for the human being. It is important for the human being, especially the Muslim in America. We have to be reminded over and over again of how much we need Allah. And I specify the American because we're around a very arrogant people who believe that they can do everything. They believe they can control the weather. They believe that they can control the food. They believe that they can control health and life. They believe that they can control everything. And so being around people like this, it has an effect on us if we don't remember Allah. And so from the benefits of remembering Allah, saying Bismillah before we do things is to what? Is to remind ourselves of our own weakness 
we have to be reminded that we are weak and that we need Allah. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There's no power, no might, no change except with Allah subhanahu wa taala. I don't have the ability to do anything except with Allah's help. Everything that I've done in my life of goodness up to this point is because of Allah. Every evil that I've been protected from up to this point is from Allah. It's not me. I made an effort. I tried, but my success is with Allah. Any other people have the same opportunity, the same effort. They tried the same maneuvers, the same tricks, the same things, but it didn't work for them. And it worked for me because Allah blessed it to work for me. Uh, if you'll allow me to digress just shortly. Um, if you go to point number four on the back of the study guide. Sheikh Tahir, uh, Dr. Wyatt, Hafizahullah, he mentioned yes, uh, the day before yesterday, in the Al Aqid al Wasatiya class, he mentioned an ayat from the Quran and he asked us for a minute or two to reflect on the ayat and to show us what it teaches about Al Qadr. And subhanAllah, for my own personal self, I saw some other things there as well, which for me just shows the importance of constantly reading the Quran. That a person might read the same ayat over and over again, but get different things at different times. We ask Allah subhanahu wa to open our hearts to understand His book. So the ayat is from Surah Al-An'am, chapter number 6 of the Qur'an, verses 27 to 28. He says, ala nari faqalu ya laytana nuraddu wa la nukaddiba wa la nukaddibu bi ayatina wa nakuna min wa la nukaddiba bi ayatina bi ayati rabbina wa nakuna min al-mu'mineen bal badanahum ma kanu yukhfuna min qabl wa law ruddu la a'adu lima nuhu anhu wa innahum lakadibun. He says, if you could only see when they are made to stand before the fire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa to save us from the fire. How they will say, if only we could be sent back, we would not reject the revelations of our Lord and we would be amongst the believers. He says, no. The truth they used to hide in their hearts will become clear to them. And if they were brought back, they would only return to the very thing that was forbidden to them. They are such liars. They are such liars. And so what point do we want to derive from this? You know, the point that we learned in al aqil al is we focused on what? Allah's? Allah's? Knowledge. That Allah knows everything. That He knows what's going to happen on the Day of Judgment, what the people are going to say, even though it hasn't happened yet. And He knows what would happen even though it will never take place. And if you send us back, we will do this and do that? He says, no. If, they, if we sent them back, they would do what? The same thing they did before. There's another point here related to what we just mentioned about humility in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what's that? Notice what they're saying here. What are they saying? What are the people who disbelieve saying? If we go back, we will worship Allah and we will be believers. Where's the arrogance in that? Not just saying something that Allah doesn't know. Not just that they knew the truth and they rejected it. Something else. Okay, so, so th that, that could be a point, the fact that they, they may be actually trying to trick Allah, because Allah mentions that the hypocrites. يَوْمَ يَحْشَرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا فَيَحْلِفُونَ لَهُ كَمَا يَحْلِفُونَ لَكُمْ وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ عَلَى شَيْءٍ On the day when He will gather them all together, and they will swear to Him like they used to swear to you all, and the things would be different. 
and they will think that they are actually, you know, that they actually have some room to work with with the law. That's a possibility. What I was looking at is the idea that they believe that they could actually go back to the earth and believe without Allah's help. Yani they believe that they themselves, if you just send me back with my own power and strength and my own determination, I can do what? I can do a believer and I can ace this Islam thing. And the idea is what? No, it's not possible. The believer has to ask every day for what? Guidance. You know, we cannot make it and be believers and hold on to Islam without Allah's help. And so a part of their arrogance is what? Is to believe that they could simply, because they want to, go back to the earth and be believers. No. There's no, oh Allah, if you help us. If you guide us, then we can be believers next time. La. Send us back and we will believe. Let us show you, we can prove it. La. And so that shows the idea of what? Of their lack of humility in front of Allah and believing that they themselves can do it on their own. At least that's what I derive from it and that's my own. But perhaps, you know, there's room for disagreement with that. But the point is what? The point is that we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help. That we need his help with everything. And so even in, 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 in standing in front of Allah to worship him, we need his help. And I also want to remind us at this moment, the importance of saying, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, with a conscious heart at the beginning of every raka of prayer. Every time we come back up to standing, don't gloss over saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, even if it's not mandatory. Say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and say it with the idea, with the conviction, with the knowledge that if Allah does not get me through this rakah, if He does not help me keep my concentration on what I'm saying in this rakah, if He does not help me to humble myself in this rakah. If he does not give me the t success to make dua like I should in this raka, I'm going to lose it. And I'm going to lose the reward of my prayer. Every time a person comes back up to standing, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, with your name, Allah, I'm going to recite this Quran and I'm going to go through this raka and I need your help to get me through it. And perhaps that's a part of the wisdom behind why, we, why it's legislated for us to say it at the beginning of each rakah. Does a person have to say it? No. And there's a difference of opinion about whether Bismillah is a part of Surah Al-Fatiha or it's not. And the strongest opinion to me, and Allah knows best, and it's, it's a, an opinion of the scholars, so it's not any, it's not a ayat specifically of Surah Al-Fatiha. So if a person got up and said, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, we couldn't say his prayer and he is, is invalid. And we couldn't say that he's sinful. But the idea is what? That Bismillah is important. That Bismillah is an acknowledgement that I need Allah's help to get through this rakah. I'm praying. I'm in the masjid. I'm here. I heard the call. I answered it. I came to the masjid. I'm praying Allah right now. But I know I can't get through this rakah. I prayed too many times and had too many whispers and thoughts and ideas run through my head to believe that I'm going to get through this rakah without your help. And so Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'm seeking your help, O oh Allah the merciful, the beneficent Allah out of your goodness and out of your kindness, get me through this rakah. Help me to benefit from this prayer. Help this prayer to have an effect on my life. Don't let me leave this prayer the same way I was when I entered it. And we need Allah, even when we worship, even when we do things that he told us to do, we need, we need his help. And so again, I'm reminding myself as well as you that we're not negligent of saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim when we pray at the beginning of each raka, and also being conscious of what we are saying when we say Bismillah. He says, so mentioning the name of Allah, we're at the top of page 32, mentioning the name of Allah at the time of doing any deed that is pleasing to Allah reminds the believer that all good, underline it, all good is from Allah, all good. 
You was, a, you was mashallah, the, the model worshiper today because Allah blessed you. Because Allah blessed you. And so we have to praise Allah. Coming to class today, alhamdulillah, Allah blesses us to come to class. To try to benefit ourselves, it's Allah's blessing. There's a lot of things that could have come in, in the way of us in coming to class today. If a person can, 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 can wake up as a believer and go to, go to sleep as a disbeliever, then why can't he change his mind about going to class or not? And going to the masjid or not to pray? And every success is with Allah's help. No. Allah the Most High mentions the saying of the Prophet Shu'aib, peace be upon him to his people, وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَلْتُ وَإِلَيْهِ أُنِيب. And my tawfiq, my success, my right guidance cannot come except from Allah. In him I trust, and unto him I repent and constantly turn to try to be better and to try to do, to do better. What do we benefit from this ayat? He says, my success cannot come except from Allah. First, we have to look at the context in which this is being said. Who's talking? Who's speaking? Shu'aib. And who is Shu'aib? A prophet of Allah. And the prophets of Allah are the best people of their time. The best worshipers with the best manners. They have the most knowledge of the deen and the most knowledge of Allah. The best people of their time. The most knowledge of Allah, the best worshipers, the best manners, the best style. I mean, if you read the, the remainder of this surah and Shu'aib's story, Wallahi, you love Shu'aib. Yet you see his gentle manners with his people when they mock him and ridicule him. They make fun of him. And still he's gentle and he doesn't, and he takes revenge for himself. And when they tell him, when they tell him that if it wasn't for your people, for your tribe, you know, we would have stoned you. And he would have killed you if it wasn't for your tribe. He responds with honor and dignity. You have more respect for my tribe than you have for Allah. And he wasn't pleased with them sparing his life, as they say, for the sake of his people. And I don't, forget my people. You're more concerned with my people than you are with Allah? SubhanAllah. And a person who reads Shu'aib, I, well, I, I love Shu'aib. And I love all the prophets. And he, but some, mashallah, you see and he, the, the manners that Allah blesses them with. And, and, and how and he seems, when, he, when he's talking to them, he seems to be shy and, and timid. You know? But then, you know, when, 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 when they talk about, when they, when they talk about Allah, you see he changes. And he just like what Sheikh Tahir, I mentioned in one of his khutbahs, in Surah, about Surah Al-Kahf, when he mentions about the people in the, in the, the, the two people in the garden. And when he was bragging about how I have more money and more children, he didn't say anything. But then when he said, I don't believe the hour is going to happen and Allah, you know, then he said, do you disbelieve in Allah? You know, I'm paraphrasing here. But when he spoke about him, he didn't say anything. But when he spoke about Allah, no, we're not going there. Do you disbelieve in the one who created you from dirt? You know, he couldn't stand someone to say something about Allah. About himself, you can say what you want to. But about Allah, no. And so Shu'aib is the same way. Allahu Akbar. And so Shu'aib, with these good manners, with knowledge of Allah, with excellent worship, what does he say? وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ There's no success for me except with Allah. عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَلْتِ I depend on Him and Him alone. And I'm constantly turning to Him, trying to worship and improve my situation with Him. يعني الإنابة is to turn quickly to worship. You know, I'm not satisfied with where I am with Allah. I always want my situation with Allah to what? To improve. I always want to be better with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. This is Shu'aib. These are the prophets. And if this is how the prophet is acting, the one chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then how should we act? Now, and so we have to ponder on these ayat. Who's speaking? 
In what context? What is he saying? And what are the implications of what he's saying? Allah the Most High commands and reminds the Prophet Wasbir, Wasbir, be patient. This is the command of Allah. Allah is telling the Prophet to what? To do something. Be patient. Wasbir. Wama sabruka illa billah. And you can only be patient with the help of Allah. And if you are patient, it's because Allah helped you. Don't become arrogant because you were patient. Don't think you were better than other people because you were patient. You have to be patient because Allah, because Allah, huh? you have to be patient because Allah commanded you. Wasbir, be patient. وَمَا صَبْرُكَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ And you won't be able to be patient except with Allah's help. And that goes back to, back to, back to what ayat in Surah Al-Fatiha? إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You do we worship and on you do we depend. We have to worship Allah, but we have to depend on Him as well. No. He says, hence the believer does every good deed in the name of Allah. Bismillah. He says, this hadith indicates that it is legislated in the Islamic law to pronounce the tasmiyah, saying Bismillah in the beginning of ablution, in the beginning of wudu. However, the Muslim scholars differ about its ruling as to whether it is commendable mustahab or is obligatory wajib. The scholars differ as to whether saying Bismillah is mandatory or whether it's mustahab and recommended. And whether someone is excused if they did not say it due to forgetfulness or ignorance of its ruling. All right? So, first we disagree, or scholars disagree about whether what? Is it mandatory or is it extra? Number two, if I believe that it's mandatory, if I forget, does that nullify my wudu or is my wudu still valid? Two issues. The first thing to notice or to note if we go to the other side of the handout, number three, it says, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no wudu for the one who does not mention Allah's name upon it, reported by Ahmed, Abu Dawood, and Ibn Majah. This is in, from Al-Bulugh uh, Al-Maram, he says, with a weak chain of narrators. Imam Ahmed said, لا يثبت فيه شيء. You know, there's nothing authentic as it relates to saying Bismillah regarding wudu. Imam Ahmed said, there is no sound hadith for saying what? Bismillah as it relates to wudu. And so the scholars of hadith differ about whether this hadith is sahih or not. But the scholars seem to agree, or the majority of scholars say that it is any permissible and even recommended to say Bismillah when you make wudu. Also, one of the other reasons why scholars differ as to whether it is mandatory or not is because with all the descriptions of wudu from the Prophet ﷺ, we don't have one authentic description of wudu where the Prophet ﷺ began saying, Bismillah. We know that he washed his hands before he started. We know that he washed his face that he went from the front of his head to the back and then brought his hands back. We have all types of details, what kind of vessel he, the water was poured in. But in none of those narrations describing the wudu, do we have what? Bismillah. So scholars use that to say what? That it's not mandatory and that the wudu is valid without it. Although the majority say that, it's encouraged to say Bismillah when beginning. He then says, Imam Abdulaziz ibn Baz, rahimahullah, was asked about the ruling concerning a person who failed to pronounce the tasmiyah, bismillah, for ablution, for wudu, due to forget, for forgetfulness. He replied, the majority of the scholars, Imam ibn Baz is saying, the majority of the scholars hold the view that the ablution, without mentioning the name of Allah, is still valid. If a person made wudu and did not say bismillah before making wudu, the wudu is still 
valid. He says this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars based upon what we mentioned. Number one, Imam Ahmed said there's nothing authentic as it relates to saying Bismillah with wudu. And number two, it's been, not been reported in any of the descriptions of the wudu of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said other scholars hold that the view hold the view that the meaning that mentioning the name of Allah is obligatory upon the one who knows its ruling and remembers to do so. Type how do they say that it's mandatory? Because they believe the hadith is authentic. And so there's a difference of opinion about the authenticity of the hadith. This view that it is obligatory is due to the report from the Prophet ﷺ that he said there is no ablution for one who has not mentioned the name of Allah on, upon it. Again, there's a different opinion about the authenticity of that hadith. However, for the one who fails to mention the name of Allah due to forgetfulness or ignorance. So now we're talking about the one who believes that it's wajib. If someone believes based upon this hadith and based upon the opinion of the hadith scholar that he takes, if he believes that this that saying Bismillah is mandatory and he forgets to say it, or he didn't know he was supposed to say it, his ablution is valid and his wudu is still valid, even if we say that tasmiya is obligatory since he is excused due to ignorance or forgetfulness. If something is mandatory and there's no expiation mentioned, the general rule is what? That if a person forgets or does not know, then he's not held accountable. The proof of this is the saying of Allah the Most High, Rabbana la tu'akhidna in nasina o akhta'na, our Lord do not punish us, or if we forget or fall into error. It has been authentically reported from the Prophet Sallallahu that Allah the Most High answered the supplication concerning the one who forgets or fails into error mistakenly. Qad fa'alt, qad fa'alt, o kama qala. He said, I have done so, I have done so. Yani, I have agreed not to take the one to account if he forgets or makes a mistake. From this you come to know that if you forget to mention the name of Allah at the start of evolution, and then you remember why you are still performing it, then you should mention the name of Allah at that time. If you're making wudu, and when you get to the arms, you, rec you remember that you forgot to say Bismillah at the beginning, and then you get to the arms, then what? Just say Bismillah there. You don't have to go all the way to the back and start all over again. And if you don't believe that it's mandatory, you don't have to say it. You don't have to say it at all. He says, then you should mention the name of Allah any at that time. You don't have to start over again since you are excused due to forgetfulness. None. And so with that, inshallah, we want to stop there, finish what we wanted to cover today by Allah's permission. We ask Allah SWT to accept the good of it, to accept our striving to get close to him, that he help us to be of those who remember, uh, him, remember him. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Oh Allah, help us to remember you, to be thankful to you, and to worship you well. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Nahum wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira. As Abu Muhammad mentions, if there's any questions or corrections, anything that was mentioned, inshallah.